Hi everyone and thank you again for joining me on another episode of Gaffer and Gear. In today's episode, I'm reviewing the Suncrafter S300C. So I get a lot of prosumer brands ask me to review their products and with the vast majority, I say no. So what's the point of difference with this? Well, as far as I know, this is the cheapest RGB ACL light that's available on the market. It has a CCT range from 1,800 Kelvin all the way up to 20,000 Kelvin, tracking to the planking curve with very fine tunable green and magenta correction. Being an RGB ACL light, it also has an extended color gamut. So if you want to generate colors that you can't generate with RGB lights and you don't need DMX, at around 500 US dollars, RGB ACL is now affordable for a lot of people. But is it any good? Now let's start off with the regular disclaimers. Suncrafter are not paying me any money for this review and my opinions are my own, but they did send me the product for free and I do get to keep it or sell it at the end of the review. And that could on some level possibly affect my opinion. But to see if that's the case, let's start off with the negatives. All right, here's my quick list of negatives. If you're a professional user, this thing doesn't have DMX or CRMX. It also doesn't have a setup menu. So you can't do things like set a constant fan speed and you can't select your dimmer curves. It also doesn't have a weather protection rating. The screen can be a little bit hard to read if you're looking at it when it's on an angle. And it only has three modes of operation, CCT, HSI and special effects. So there's no gels libraries, no RGB mode and no XY modes. But if you're expecting those modes for $500, you might be dreaming a little bit. And the final negative, it doesn't have any direct battery mounts, but it does have a 48 volt in, so you could run it off the Aperture Power Station. Let's get into the pros now. At around 500 US dollars, this is incredibly cheap for RGB ACL. That of course gives you an extended color gamut range, in particular between your reds and your greens, and your greens and your blues. And if you're working in your ambers and yellows, the spectrum is quite impressive. The CCT color accuracy is incredibly impressive. It's what I would expect from a light costing five or six times as much as this does. And it has green and magenta correction that's adjustable in 1% increments. On the screen now is the amount of green and magenta correction measured in Delta UV. And to give you some idea, a 1 8 correction gel is somewhere around 0.0032. Now, some of you might have noticed that the green and magenta correction values are not consistent across the CCT values and don't tie into any of our existing standards. But as a positive, if we have a look at the lowest amount of correction that's available, that's about double the correction that you get on a Nanlux Evoke. In addition to having a huge CCT range, it tracks to the daylight and Planckian curves, and the build quality for the price is more than reasonable. The bulk of the body is made of plastic, but it can actually take a large modifier, such as a five foot dome with the grid attached because it's stand mount and tilt locking is metal. And it's got a nice big locking handle that gives you a really positive lock, so it's not gonna slip even with a big modifier on it. And even though you can't adjust the fan speeds, it is very quiet. Okay, let's go through price and what you get. So just having a look around online today, I've seen it as cheap as 460 US dollars. It's listed at $499 from the manufacturer, and I've seen it as high as 550 US dollars. Now it comes in a cardboard box with padding, no bag. You get a power supply with a cable for mounting it to your light stand, and this has a three pin 48 volt XLR connector. You get an IEC power lead, you get a Bowen mount faceted reflector, which is painted in matching white. You get your instruction manual, and on the back of the instruction manual is the QR code for downloading the phone app. You of course get the light. Now the bulk of the light's housing is plastic. One of the exceptions is the stand mount and tilt lock. However, the handle is made of plastic and the umbrella mount screwed to the side is also made of plastic. The COB section is metal. However, the Bowen mount around it is made of industrial plastic. The Bowen mount locking is located on the side of the light and on the back of the light, you've got your user interface, your on off button and your 48 volt DC inlet. Okay, let's do a quick run through of the user interface. Next to the screen, you have your Bluetooth reset button, which is for your phone app. I don't review phone apps. And underneath that is the mode button. Directly below the screen, you've got two knobs. 
one for dimming, and the other one is to set your parameters. At the moment, we're in the CCT mode. The dimming is adjustable in 1% increments. If you press the button, it will jump in 20% increments. The other knob toggles between your green and magenta correction by pressing the button, and turning the button will select your Kelvin or your green and magenta value. The CCT is adjustable in 50 Kelvin increments, and the green and magenta is adjustable in 1% increments. To change your mode, press the mode button. Now we're in the HSI mode. The left button adjusts your brightness values, and the right button is used to adjust your color hue. As you change your color hue, RGB values are also displayed in 8-bit DMX values. If you want to change your saturation, press the button to change a parameter to the saturation. Now the light desaturates to the D65 standard and you can't select the Kelvin at which you desaturate to. The next mode of operation is your effects mode. There are 19 effects. As far as I can tell, you can't adjust the parameter on these effects. And if you can figure out what the effects are, you've got more imagination than I do. Now let's take a look at the light with no modifiers attached. And this definitely doesn't have the widest beam angle that I've come across on COB lights. However, it does seem pretty consistent with the beam angle on the majority of RGB ACL lights or lights with glare engines, for example. Regardless of the CCT or color that you dial in, the coloring is very consistent across the beam and there's no color fraying towards the edge. This is the consistency of the light across the beam at a distance of two meters. And it's currently 41 degrees Celsius in my workshop, which is why I'm walking around like a barefoot bogan. And the shadows are nice and sharp. Now let's take a look at the light with the supplied reflector. And just to note, later in the episode, all of my stats are taken with the light with no modifier attached. So here's a quick spectrometer reading at 3200 with the supplied reflector. And as you can see, it has a good CCT, a very good white point, and a TM30 color render score of 93. At 5600 Kelvin, it also has a good CCT, a TM30 color render score of 93, and the white point is closer to the daylight curve than it is to the Planckian curve. This reflector's on a par with most faceted reflectors. It's not perfectly even, but it doesn't have any hot spots that are going to create issues for you. And regardless of CCT or color dialed in, the characteristics across the beam seem to be the same. And now let's take a look at the evenness of the beam at a distance of two meters. And this is how much the weather changes in Melbourne. The day before, it was 41 degrees in my workshop, and today it's colder than my ex-mother-in-law's smile. And as you would expect from a faceted dish, we've got our double shadowing. Now let's take a look at this light with a third-party Fresnel. And I'm using the Nanlite FL20G. This Fresnel seems to work with a lot of lights that it wasn't designed for. At 3200 Kelvin, the CCT is very accurate. We've got a TN30 color render score of 93, and the white point is almost perfect with a delta UV of plus 0 0.0004. At 5600 Kelvin, the target CCT is a bit off, but only by 94. We've still got a TN30 color render score of 93, and the white point is pretty good with a delta UV of plus 0.0011, so there's no noticeable color hue. 
Now this Fresnel works extremely well in conjunction with this light. It has a nice even beam with no noticeable hotspot. And the barn door cuts are really good. There is a slight bit of convexing, but that's normal on a lot of Fresnels. And the flood spot works really well. Now regardless of the CCT or colour that you dial in, the characteristics are very consistent. At a distance of 2 metres, I was surprised by how even it was. And the shadows are pretty good. There is a little bit of double shadowing, but that's typical with most Fresnels. Let's go through the data I've collected, starting off by going through the AC power draw. The maximum power draw recorded automatically over several days of testing was 345.7 watt. At 3200 Kelvin, I recorded 303.2 watt. And at 5600 Kelvin, I recorded 341.2 watt. If you're looking to run this light off a battery power station, you should have no problem at all because the power factor unity scores are respectable. Now let's take a look at the dimming characteristics. According to my frequency meter, this light is running at 25 kilohertz. So it should be high speed flicker free. Now let's take a look at the dimming characteristics at 3200 Kelvin. The target value is very consistent down to 50% and then below 50% the relationship is not linear. Right down at the bottom when you've got the light set to 1% you're actually getting 10% of the original output. The CCT is not perfect but it is very consistent across the entire dimming range. The TM30 RF color score is either a 93 or a 94 and the white point delta UV or color hue is extremely consistent all the way through the dimming range. Now let's take a look at 5600 Kelvin. The target value brightness and the output of the light are very accurate all the way down to 50%. Then below 50% the relationship is not linear. Again 1% is actually 10% of the original brightness. The CCT has a good consistency across the dimming range although it is not awesome. The TM30 color render score does drop from a 93 down to a 91 and the delta UV green magenta shift or white point placement is very consistent down to 25%. From 10% and below there is a lot of variation. Now let's have a look at the average CCT accuracy. Between 1800 Kelvin and 6000 Kelvin the light is incredibly accurate to the CCT value. From 6050 Kelvin to 6650 it is not as accurate but still impressive. However, from 6,700 Kelvin to 7,000 Kelvin, where I stopped taking individual readings, the average accuracy does balloon out to minus 108 Kelvin. Now let's take a look at the color render scores measured in TM30RF. The highest color score I recorded was a 96, but that was only at 2,200 Kelvin. Now usually in my reviews, I give you the exact TM30 color scores between the bottom CCT and 7,000 Kelvin. However, in this case, there's a lot of subtle variation between all of the Kelvins. So I have to give you averages in blocks. Between 1800 Kelvin and 2050 Kelvin, the average increases. And then as a generalization, the higher the CCT target value, the lower the color render score. Now let's take a look at the green and magenta hue or white point placement measured in delta UV. Between 1800 Kelvin to 4000 Kelvin, this is tracking very impressively to the Planckian curve. From 4000 Kelvin to 5000 Kelvin, it then breaks away from the Planckian curve and starts heading to a point roughly halfway between the daylight curve and the Planckian curve, which is why I haven't given an average. Between 5050 Kelvin to 6000 Kelvin, it is tracking halfway between the daylight curve and the Planckian curve. 
which is a real safe middle ground for the light to be tracking on. And from 6050 Kelvin to 7000 Kelvin, where I stopped taking individual readings, it is continuing to track halfway between the daylight and Planckian curve. Let's take a more detailed look at some of the Kelvins now, starting off with the lowest Kelvin that we can dial in. When I dialed in 1,800 Kelvin, I got 1,839. The TM30 color testing results were 90% average color accuracy with an average 104% color saturation. With the CRI scores, only R9 is below 90. This is the spectrum distribution, and the Y point was very accurate with a delta UV of minus 0.0006. When I dialed in 2,500 Kelvin, I got 2,488. The TM30 color testing scores are a 95% average color accuracy with an average 102% color saturation. With the CRI scores, R12 is below 90. The spectrum distribution is okay, but it's not as chunky as you'd get on one of the more expensive top end lights. However, the white point placement is pretty much perfect with a delta UV of plus 0.0001. When I dialed in 3,200 Kelvin, I got 3,158 with an SSI score of 83. The TN30 color testing results were 93% average color accuracy with an average 100% color saturation. With the CRI scores, R12 is below 90. This is the spectrum distribution and again, the white point is almost perfect with a delta UV of plus 0.0004. When I dialed in 4,400 Kelvin, I got 4,412. The TM30 color testing results were 93% average color accuracy with an average 100% color saturation. With the CRI scores, only R12 is below 90. This is the spectrum distribution. And the white point is very good with a delta UV of plus 0.0006. When I dialed in 5,600 Kelvin, I got 5,562 with an SSI score of 72. The TN30 color testing results were 93% average color accuracy with an average 101% color saturation. With the CRI scores, again, R12 is the only one below 90. This is the spectrum distribution. And the white point comes in with a delta UV of plus 0.0013, which places it halfway between the Planckian curve and the daylight curve. When I dialed in 10,000 Kelvin, I got 9,830. The TM30 color testing scores came in with a 90% average color accuracy and a 98% average color saturation. With the CRI scores, R12 is below 90. This is the spectrum distribution. And the white point is tracking closer to the daylight curve than the Planckian curve with a delta UV of plus 0.0025. When I dialed in the top Kelvin of 20,000, I got 19,602. The TN30 color testing results were 89% color accuracy with an average 99% color saturation. With the CRI scores, R12 is the only one below 90, and these are surprisingly good CRI scores for 20,000 Kelvin. This is the spectrum distribution, and the white point came in with a delta UV of plus 0.0021. Now let's take a look at how accurately this light can dial in its color vectors. When I dialed in zero degrees or 360 degrees or red, it was smack on at zero degrees. When I dialed in 120 degrees or green, it was smack on at 120 degrees. Blue or 240 degrees was also smack on. Yellow, which should be 60 degrees, came in very close at 61 degrees. And this is one of the best spectrum distributions I've ever seen for a yellow. When I dialed in 180 degrees or cyan, I got 206. And when I dialed in 300 degrees or magenta, I got 280. Okay, my closing thoughts. For me personally, this light is a no because it doesn't have CRMX, and that is a massive part of my workflow these days. But 500 US dollars or thereabouts for an RGB ACL light engine, that's pretty impressive. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that getting a yellow like this was the holy grail, but now it's affordable for pretty much everybody that needs decent lights. Now that brings me to my closing thoughts and my last point to a lot of manufacturers. If you've got a light that's bicolor and doesn't have green and magenta correction, good luck trying to sell it. I mean, this is an entry level light with RGB ACL. You need to at least have bicolor with green and magenta correction, and you really should be thinking past RGBWW, especially if you want to be in business in the next couple of years. 
I'm Andrew Locke. See you on the next episode of Gaffer and Gear. Thank you again for watching.